This may be, hopefully, the grandest moment or a grand moment for classical music. That was the voice of the late, great Van Cliburn. Competition, how musicians saved the world, maybe. We will explore what may well have been the most important competition of the 20th century, the first international Tchaikovsky competition. We'll also explore the competition between the world's great superpowers, the United States of America and the Soviet Union and discuss how music may have played a role in preventing the nuclear annihilation of every living creature on our planet, and indeed the Earth itself. In today's program, we'll explore some of the ways in which Oppenheimer's nuclear weapon changed the world, and also consider the long-term implications of the 1958 Tchaikovsky competition. The implications of both are still reverberating all over the world today, and indeed specifically right here in Australia. To understand the extraordinary significance of the 1958 Tchaikovsky competition, let's begin by hearing from our friends and allies in the United States of America, a country to which we are, quote, joined by the hip, unquote, according to the former Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull. The following program was broadcast on NPR Radio on February 29, 2008, and is narrated by Sarah Fishko. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. From City Hall Plaza, WNYC, brings you a special broadcast of the official reception for pianist Van Cliburn. The mayor is proclaimed today as American Music Day, symbolized in the person of the young Texas musician Van Cliburn. Fifty years ago, a tall, curly-haired Texan pianist named Van Cliburn was given the full hero's tribute in New York. In just a few minutes, Mayor Robert F. Wagner will greet Mr. Cliburn and deliver the... How was it that a classical musician could inspire this unprecedented idolatry? Well, it all started with Tchaikovsky. The first Tchaikovsky International Piano Competition, held in Moscow in 1958. It was part of a movement toward a cultural thaw in the Cold War, after a period of many years of complete disassociation between the two great superpowers, the U.S. and the USSR. Earlier that year, in January, the United States and the Soviet Union had signed a general agreement on exchanges, including performing arts. Yale Richmond was a U.S. Foreign Service officer at the time, working in Poland and the Soviet Union. The Soviet plan, he remembers, was to invite international musicians to compete with Russians for a grand prize. And the idea was to gain publicity and show that under the Soviet system they were producing these great artists and they wanted to show the world what they had done. An international group of 50 contestants traveled to Russia from 19 countries including a few Americans. I decided I wanted desperately to go. Pianist and Juilliard faculty member Jerome Lowenthal was then studying in Paris on a fellowship. He scraped together the plane fare and headed to Moscow via Prague to enter the contest. Remember, this was 1958. Stalin had been dead for only five years. It was like going to the moon to go to, to Moscow. I felt that way. And for them, it was like being visited by people from another planet. Once there, he encountered his competitor, the 23-year-old Clyburn, who had a few years before won an American competition, the Leventritt, and then drifted into a rather unremarkable career. But everybody knew that he was an extraordinary young pianist, and of course he was an extraordinary person. You know, I was sort of an East Coast snob, and Van was a uh, Texas Baptist of a style that was new to me. You know, he was sort of a legend at Juilliard. Critic Harris Goldsmith was studying at the Manhattan School of Music. He'd heard the talk about Clyburn, and later he heard the piano playing. What I liked about this playing is that it was natural, and he had a beautiful tone, and he didn't distort the phrases. He was himself. The jury thought so, too. And what a jury, a who's who of music, 
among them Russian pianists Emil Gilels and Sviatoslav Richter, composers Dmitry Kabalevsky and Sir Arthur Bliss. Chairman of the whole competition was Dmitry Shostakovich. Contestants were required to perform three times before the Distinguished Bunch over a two-week period. Clyburn famously tore into the Tchaikovsky First Piano Concerto. I was told that when the competition was nearing its end, Van had created this absolute furor. President of the jury, pianist Emil Gilles, was in a quandary. They all loved Clyburn's playing, but this was a Russian competition with many Russian competitors. Could they give the prize to an American? Gilles went to Khrushchev and said, I don't know what to do. And Khrushchev, according to the story I was told, said, is the American the best? And Gilel said yes. And Khrushchev said, then give him the prize. Now, that's wonderful. I like to believe that story. And that is the story everywhere you read about it. Foreign Service veteran Yale Richmond knows the story. And the uh, judges said, yes, he was the best. And Khrushchev said, well, give him the prize. But there is usually something political involved in anything the Soviets did with regard to the United States. And I think the Soviets were trying to show that they were sincere in carrying out the provisions of the cultural agreement. History is made at the keyboard. Even before the Tchaikovsky concerto is over, the conclusion is clear. 23-year-old Van Cleburne of Texas, American-born and American-trained, wins one of the top honors of the world of music. Literally overnight, he went from total obscurity to having his name pronounced correctly on the lips of every American and every Russian, too. He was the idol of the Russian Bobby Soxers. The young people thronged about him wherever he went, and they liked his, his good looks as well as his playing. And I remember a woman coming to me, and she said, Oh, we, we love him so much. He is like our son. Everybody loved him. Khrushchev loved him. America loved him as he rode through the canyon of hero in New York. There is the cry. You can hear it in the background. The photographer is running before the car, and there is Mr. Van Clyburn, a tall young man, six foot four, and he looks tall as he's standing up there. He's gasping, he's shaking his head. <laughs> he has a tousled, sandy head. He has his hand. It was an odd affair, an event both classically patriotic and also hopeful beyond mere patriotism. The lanky southern ambassador beat the system, it seemed, whatever the system was. This whole thing had simply not been expected. Now, I certainly know now, and I don't know if I knew then, that the Russians had planned this competition as a post-Sputnik event to show that they were as supreme in the arts as well as technology. Some years later, people started saying in America, well, the Russians were so clever to give it to an American. But that really, I'm willing to swear, was not true at all. You would have had to be there to see how excited people were.
Besides, my friends, I hope that you will say an occasional prayer for me, that I never fail to live up to what has happened today. Whether or not Van Cliburn has lived up to the promise of all this is a matter of opinion, but it's a matter of history that during a warming trend in the Cold War, he was Charles Lindbergh, John Glenn, and the New York Giants all rolled into one. For WNYC, I'm Sarah Fishkin. That program was broadcast on NPR Radio on February 29, 2008, and is entitled How Van Cliburn Took Moscow. How Van Cliburn Took Moscow. To me, that title sounds like the German invasion of Western Europe in May 1940. German troops overran Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and then they, quote, took, unquote, France in six weeks starting from May 1940. To me, the title, How Van Cliburn, quote, took, unquote, Moscow, makes it sound as if somehow Van Cliburn was on a quest for territory, power, or world domination. Perhaps his actual quest was the quest to understand and appreciate music. On the 27th of February 2013, PBS NewsHour also made a program about Van Cliburn. In it, we hear from the late great artist himself. April 1958, a young Texan named Van Cliburn is the surprise winner of the first international Tchaikovsky piano competition in Moscow. Coming just six months after the Soviets launched Sputnik, amid a mounting arms race and heightened Cold War tensions, the performance galvanized the nation and received worldwide attention. New York City adds its own bravo to the worldwide crescendo of applause for Van Cliburn. On his return to the U.S., the 23-year-old Cliburn was given a ticker tape parade down Broadway, the only classical musician ever so honored. I was amazed and I said, well, I think this may be, not for me, but this may be, hopefully, the grandest moment or a grand moment for classical music. Fifty years later, Van Cliburn lives in a grand home just outside Fort Worth, still very much the tall Texan, as he was so often described back then. He was recently feted by friends with a grand anniversary gala, Classical music, classical art, is forever. And he says he remembers every detail of his experience in Moscow. I got off of the plane and there was this very lovely, gracious, nice lady, Genrietta Belayeva, and I still know her to this day. <laughs> and she said, Mr. Van Cliburn? And I thought, Yes, welcome to Moscow. So all the time I was there, I never told them that in this country we pronounce it Van Cliburn. So I have two names, Van Cliburn and Van Cliburn. When you went to Moscow, mm -hmm. did you feel that you were part of history at that moment? No, no, you didn't feel that way. The history was that this was the very first competition that uh, they had had in Russia. And it was very exciting, particularly for me to see the jury. It was an unbelievable jury. Uh, Shostakovich, Emil Gilal, Sviatoslav Richter. The, the greatest uh, uh, musicians of the Soviet Union. Oboren. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And I mean, it was very, that was, that was frightening. The jury was more frightening than the audience. But then after, uh, Time passed, and, and we got to, I got to have the privilege of being with them. They were so real and such nice people. And they were, they, the uh, simplicity within complexity of great music shown. What does that mean? Uh, classical music 
is supposed to seem simple. Within simplicity is great, enormous complexity. So you have to make it you seem must make simple. It look simple or easy. And how do you do but that? I don't know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it is complex. There's so much to it. It's architecture. You have a time span that your mind must comprehend. When you walk out to play a piece, you must see the last note as you start the first note. Back in 1958, Time magazine put Clyburn on its cover as the Texan who conquered Russia. But that's clearly not the way he saw it. Well, that's not possible, not in great art. If they appreciate what you did, I am so grateful because they were wonderful to me. They were such great audiences, I cannot begin to tell you. I didn't conquer anything. As a matter of fact, they conquered my heart. As Sarah Fishko mentioned in her NPR radio program, quote, during a warming period in the Cold War, Van Clyburn was Charles Lindbergh, John Glenn, and the New York Giants all rolled into one. John Glenn, of course, was the first American to orbit the Earth, circling it three times in 1962. Speaking of astronauts, often when people are asked, who was the second man to set foot on the moon, they draw a blank. And the answer, of course, to that question is Buzz Aldrin. People also often forget the name of the second person to stand on the summit of Mount Everest. And the answer, of course, to that question is Tenzing Norgay. Now, my dear listeners, I'd like to ask you, which pianist was awarded second prize in the 1958 Tchaikovsky competition? A competition which, I must reiterate may well be the most important competition in the 20th century. And the answer to that very important question, of course, is Lev Vlasenko. Lev Vlasenko was born on the 24th of December, 1928, in Tiflis, Georgian SSR, Soviet Union. Lev Vlasenko's first music teacher was his mother, Vera. Lev entered the music school for gifted children in Tiflis in the class of Anastasia, David Dovna Vissolatse, herself a pupil of the renowned Anna Yesapova. Lev began to play in public at an early age. At the age of 10 years, he played Beethoven's Piano Concerto No. 1. In 1948, Lev Vlasenko entered the class of Yakov Flia at the Moscow Conservatory and completed his undergraduate and postgraduate studies. He gained international recognition after winning the first prize and gold medal at the Franz Liszt International Piano Competition in Budapest in 1956. He and Chinese pianist Liu Shikan came second to Van Klyburn in the inaugural International Tchaikovsky Piano Competition in 1958. Lev Lysenko taught at the Moscow Conservatory for 39 years. He has taught several world-renowned pianists, such as Mikhail Pletnev, Natasha Vlasenko, Oleg Sepinov, Duncan Gifford, and others. In the early 1990s, he was professor in the United States at Indiana University and the New England Conservatory, Boston. Lev Lysenko was a jury member of many international piano competitions. They include the International Tchaikovsky Piano Competition in Moscow, the Sydney International Piano Competition, the Leeds International Piano Forte Competition, the International Chopin Piano Competition in Warsaw, the Liszt Piano Competition in Budapest, the Arthur Rubinstein Piano Competition in Tel Aviv, and many others. Lev Lysenko became the president of the International Tchaikovsky Piano Competition Jury in 1994. He also headed the International Association of Tchaikovsky Competition Stars. In 1991, he was decorated a People's Artist of the USSR. During his final years, Vlasenko resided in Australia, teaching at the Queensland Conservatorium Griffith University. He was awarded an honorary doctorate by Griffith University in 1996 in recognition of his vast contribution to the development of the conservatorium. He died on the 24th of August 1996 in Brisbane, Australia. According to Sviatoslav Richter, quote, Lev Vlasenko is a great artist. Listeners enjoyed his excellent performance of Liszt's Sonata in B minor, 
a piece which is extremely complicated because of its profound ideas and virtuosity. A magnificent sense of form and style of different pieces, such as the Liszt Sonata and the Shostakovich Prelude and Fugue in D minor. Those were the words of the great Sviatoslav Richter, and that information can be found on Wikipedia. Lev Vlasenko had a very special relationship with the composer Franz Liszt. More about that later. Now, let's hear Lev Vlasenko performing the Liszt Piano Sonata number one. Now, let's talk about the art of Natasha Vlasenko. The virtuosity, the courage, and everything. This may be, hopefully, the grandest moment, or a grand moment, for classical music. Natasha Flosenko has performed in Russia, Italy, Germany, Austria, Japan, New Zealand, China, Australia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Vietnam, and other countries. She has performed under the batons of many conductors, such as Karl Martin, Mikhail Pletnev, Vladimir Verbitsky, Richard Hickox, and John Kuro. She has recorded a number of CDs in Russia and Australia and is a distinguished artist on the Master Performers record label. Natasha Vlasenko was born in Moscow, Soviet Russia, to pianist Lev Nikolaevich Vlasenko and English teacher Mikhaila Yakovlevna Krutatovska. Vlaseka was a graduate of the Moscow Central Music School under Eleonora Musoyelian. She studied in the Moscow Conservatory under the famous pianist and teacher Yakov Flia. After his death, she continued her postgraduate studies in the class of Flia's pupil, Professor Lev Vlasenko. She began her artistic career as a soloist of the Moscow Philharmonia. She commenced her pedagogic activities as a piano teacher in the Central Music School. In 1977, she won third prize at the International Beethoven Competition in Vienna. In 1985, she went on to win third prize at the Ferruccio Busoni International Piano Competition in Bolzano, Italy. My fellow Australians and citizens of the world, would you believe that Lev Vlasenko's daughter, Natasha Vlasenko, is now living and working in Australia? She is head of keyboard at the Queensland Conservatorium Griffith University. Many of her students have become prize winners of national and international piano competitions and professors in music schools in the United States, Ireland and Australia. In 1999, Vlasenko and her husband, Oleg Stepanov, co-founded the Lev Vlasenko Piano Competition in memory of her father, Lev Vlasenko. Vlasenko and Stepanov have since taken up the roles of artistic directors of the piano competition. The competition is the only major piano event in Australia that mirrors the requirements of an international piano competition and is held in Brisbane every two years since 1999. In 2018, Natasha Vlasenko appeared with the Russian National Orchestra for the fourth time under Mikhail Pletnev, performing Mozart's double piano concerto with Eliso Vasilatse piano. Let's hear Natasha Vlasenko with Lev Vlasenko playing the concerto in E flat major for two pianos and orchestra K365. And we're going to hear the Rondo Allegro, which is the finale. Thank you. 
That was Natasha Flasenko with Lev Flasenko playing the concerto in E flat major for two pianos and orchestra, K365. That recording is available on Apple Music. You can buy it from Apple Music or stream it on their platform. <laughs> 